Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you all again like this. And many people that I'm seeing for the first time, uh, hello to you all. Uh, so I heard uh, Salem, or Groot, or Ola, <laughs> and Anyo, Anyo Naseyo, that's Korean, and, and hello. <laughs> uh, so um, I was thinking about what to preach on, um, and it's been the, it's, it was the Platinum Jubilee, uh, and so many of us had four days off work in the week. Thank God for the Queen. <laughs> um, it's an important, I thought it was a good occasion, uh, marking the 70 years of reign uh, that the Queen has had. Uh, Jubilee, we probably wouldn't have another one in our life, would we? Um, but there is also someone else's coronation uh, that we remember. Uh, and Pentecost, which is where we remember uh, the Lord Jesus pouring the Holy Spirit, is part of Jesus's coronation 2,000 years ago. He is exalted high, and then he sends the gift of the Holy Spirit to his people. Uh, and I thought it would be great uh, to remind ourselves of the Holy Spirit, what he has done, what he is, who he is in our lives, uh, and to thank and praise God for him. So today's text is from Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Uh, so turn with me just again to verse 38, and we read these words. And Peter said to them, after they asked, brothers, what shall we do? Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And my message is simply entitled, The Gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, I must confess that Pentecost Sunday today is not a Sunday that I anticipate as much. I'm going to confess, I only realized that it was Pentecost Sunday about last week. <laughs> so last week, someone said that it's Ascension Day. And I thought, oh, wait, if it's Ascension Day, the day we remember Jesus going up to heaven, 10 days afterwards, it'll be Pentecost. So Jesus resurrected for 40 days. He's on earth. And then 10 days afterwards, Pentecost. So Pentecost is today. Uh, it doesn't stand out in our calendar like Christmas or Easter, does it? If I were to ask you whether you know of any traditions that's connected with Pentecost Sunday, you'd probably scratch your head. For Christmas, you might think about having a nice meal with your family and getting presents. And for Easter, you might think uh, about meeting for special Easter services and getting chocolate eggs. <laughs> That's what we do in, the, in, the, in, in Britain, don't we? But for Pentecost Sunday, there isn't much we can think of, is there? And this might give us the impression that it's not that important. My hope this morning is to convince you that Pentecost Sunday is as important as Christmas and Easter. Ooh. <laughs> this sounds like a very ambitious task, doesn't it? Now, I don't think I can change how you celebrate Pentecost Sunday. I'm not suggesting that you have a special family meal or give presents to one another, although that'd be great. <laughs> But I do want to change how important you think Pentecost is and to remember what it is about and praise God for what he has done in it. And the reason that it's so important is because of the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is today's sermon title, as I mentioned. If in Christmas we celebrate God's gift to us of his son, then in Pentecost, we celebrate God's gift to us of his spirit. In the way we thank God for sending God the son during Christmas, we can thank God for sending God the spirit on Pentecost. So Pentecost is as important as Christmas because of the gift 
of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is as important as the Son. Also, Pentecost is a continuation of Christ's work of redemption to save us. Jesus' work doesn't just finish with his resurrection on Easter Sunday. We can think about Jesus' work of redemption like this. A series of steps going down and then a series of steps going up. He was born of a woman. It's God, but born of a woman. Born under the law. He suffered and died on the cross. And he rose on the third day. He appeared to his disciples, ascended into heaven, sat at the right hand of the Father, and poured out the promised gift of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. Down and then up. Humbled himself, and God exalted him. Therefore, to forget about Pentecost is to forget the full extent of Jesus' work. Pentecost is Jesus' work of sending his coronation gift when he became king, when he ascended and sat at his father's right hand. That gift, that coronation gift of the Holy Spirit, he sent it to his people. So Pentecost is as important as Easter because of the gift of the Holy Spirit. So I hope that even if you don't do anything special per se, that you remember that Pentecost is as important as Christmas and Easter. So I want to speak today about the gift of the Holy Spirit and how to receive this gift. First point, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, a gift has a giver or givers of the gift and receiver or receivers of the gift. A lover might give a gift to a beloved. And parents might give gifts to their children. Who is the gift of the Holy Spirit from? And who is the gift given to? Please your attention to verse 33 of chapter 2 in Acts. In verse 33, it says, Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God. Jesus is exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he, Jesus, has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. So Jesus, as I said before, Jesus was exalted to the right hand of God, and this is the part of the series of steps going up. He humbled himself, therefore God exalted him to the highest place. And part of his exaltation is the Father giving him the promised gift of the Holy Spirit. So that Jesus might give the gift to his people. And so he poured out the Holy Spirit to his disciples. Because Jesus accomplished the work of laying down his life on the cross, which was given to him by his Father. The Father exalts him and crowns him with honor and glory and gives him the coronation gift of the Holy Spirit poured out to his people. The Lord Jesus Christ had the Holy Spirit upon him when he was on earth. Uh, in his baptism, the Holy Spirit came down upon him like a dove, didn't he? But after he completes the work given to him, he receives the Holy Spirit from his Father to pour out to his people. He doesn't just have the Holy Spirit for himself, but as the promised Messiah who accomplished his work, he received the Holy Spirit to give to others. So the Holy Spirit is first a gift from the Father to the Son, and then a gift from the Son to his people. The gift of the Holy Spirit, I, I think, is an overflow of the love and generosity of the triune God. Uh, if think about it. The Father loves the Son and gives him the Spirit, and the Spirit loves the Father and the Son, and is willing to be gifted by the Father to the Son. And the Son loves his people and gives them the Spirit as well, that we might partake in the revolving circle of love of the Trinity, uh, as some uh, theologians have said. 
And this gift of the Holy Spirit is the gift of God himself to us. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is not an impersonal power or energy, though he is powerful and energetic. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity who is equal with the Father and with the Son. Though the three persons are distinct, they are one true God into whose name we are baptized in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. And as we look at this chapter, we can get a sense of the nature of the gift of the Holy Spirit. What, or more correctly, who is this gift? First, the Holy Spirit is God's breath of life. We, in verse 2, we see in verse 2, uh, turn with me to chapter 2, verse 2. We read this. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house that they were sitting. Now, the Holy Spirit is depicted in the Bible often as wind or breath. Uh, in Hebrew, uh, it's the same word for wind or breath. Uh, the word is ruach. <laughs> I really like saying it because it's very throaty. Try saying it with me. Ruach. Ruach. <laughs> now, uh, when you say it, it makes you breathe out as well, doesn't it? <laughs> we read in the first chapter of the Bible that the Ruach of God, the spirit, the breath of God was hovering over the waters. And the life-creating work of God begins. Likewise, in the account of Adam's creation in Genesis 2, we read that the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath, the ruach of life. And the man became a living being. The gift of the Holy Spirit is God's breath of life. His ruach. And it came like a violent rushing wind on the day of Pentecost to give life and power to those who received him. Even if perhaps our lives may feel sometimes feel empty and void of purpose. Some of us have left our homes and we may be struggling. We don't know what life is about at the moment, perhaps. If we have the gift of the Holy Spirit, we have God's breath of life in us, which is life indeed. <sighs> the Holy Spirit is also God's presence. We see in Acts chapter 2, verse 3, uh, turn with me there, just straight afterwards, um, that, um, he, and divided tongues of, as of fire appeared to them, the disciples, and rested on each one of them. Now, God's presence in the Bible is often depicted with fire in the Old Testament. God appears to Moses in a burning bush. God led the Israelites in the wilderness with a pillar of cloud and fire above the tabernacle, above the tent. So fire was used to depict God's presence and his guidance. And this is also received in the gift of the Holy Spirit. And whereas there was the pillar of fire above the technical when the Israelites were in the wilderness, on Pentecost, there was what seemed to be tongues of fire that came to rest on each of the disciples. They are now the technical. They are now the temple, the dwelling place of God. Therefore, Paul tells the Corinthians that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is in us whom we receive from God. The gift of the Holy Spirit is not only God's breath of life, but also God's holy presence dwelling in us. Dwelling within us, he guides and leads us and transforms us in holiness. Even if our lives may be missing the presence sometimes of friends and family who we might have left in our homes uh, back in other, other countries. My parents are also far away as well. 
if we have the gift of the Holy Spirit, we have God's presence with us as we work, as we raise our children, as we share the gospel with someone, as we worship him now, even when we are alone, we're never truly alone because God is with us. The Holy Spirit is also God's revelation. The breath of life, the presence of God, and God's revelation to us as well. Uh, in verse 3, that the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they begin to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, some people read this to say that a mark of whether you receive the Holy Spirit or not is whether you can speak in tongues or not. Now, but, and by tongues, they often mean a language that you or others don't understand. Some circles in Christian churches uh, sometimes emphasize this. Uh, but we see in this chapter that, that the languages that were spoken were understood by other people. Uh, we read through this in verse 6 and 11. And also when Peter gives an explanation of what's going on, he quotes from Joel 2 to say that the Spirit has the effect of giving God's revelation to people. Uh, verse 17, 18, it says, In the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Revelation language. And your young men shall see visions. Revelation. And your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. God's revelation is given through the Spirit. Sorry. And the Holy Spirit gives revelation and light. The Holy Spirit doesn't give confusion, but gives God's revelation. And that is what Peter himself states. Likewise, when someone receives the Holy Spirit, they don't speak with confusion, I don't think, but God's truth is revealed to them. Often a new believer, uh, a new believer talk, uh, talks about their eyes being opened. I think Mark kind of was demonstrating this uh, in his talk. Uh, they read the Bible. And whereas before their eyes were darkened to read his truths, their eyes become enlightened to read God's word with great understanding. The word of God uh, kind of convicts us of our sins, doesn't it? Uh, coming to read the Bible in such a way with light from the Holy Spirit is a mark of true conversion. Jesus is the light, but the Spirit also gives that light. But someone who is still darkened to God's word doesn't have the Spirit to give them light and reveal God's word to them. So the gift of the Holy Spirit is not only God's breath of life, God's holy presence, but also God's revelation to us. In, even when the world seems out of control, and people are confused about what's going on with wars and pandemics and all these things. We can know God's will revealed to us by the Holy Spirit and read God's word with light to live with understanding. I want you to think about how amazing is this gift? The gift of God's life, his presence, his light. For the sake of time, I won't go into the depths, into the benefits of God's forgiveness, which we read of in verse 38. Even to those who crucified Jesus, this promised gift is given. The gift of the Holy Spirit is connected to the forgiveness of even the greatest of sins. Also, I won't go into the depths about the Spirit empowering the believers to witness of Jesus, which is what Jesus told them would happen. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. As the Spirit empowered Jesus in his earthly ministry, the Spirit empowered Jesus' disciples, and the same Spirit empowers Christians now as we witness of Jesus. There's a lot more to say, but I won't go into it for the sake of time. Now, even as we testify of Jesus, talking over the fence to our neighbors, writing an email or a text to a friend, speaking to someone on the streets or in a Zoom meeting about Jesus, 
the Holy Spirit empowers us to witness of Jesus. Now, truly, this gift of the Holy Spirit is an amazing gift in whom we all, who we all need and whom the Father is ready to generously give to all those who ask him. Ask God if you've never asked him before for this gift of the Holy Spirit. You might have asked for other things, perhaps money, success, health, and so on. But the gift of the Holy Spirit is an amazing gift that we all need more than any earthly treasure to receive the Holy Spirit is to receive Christ himself. And to receive Christ is to receive God. So to finish the sermon, how do we receive this gift? What does it look like to ask for this gift of the Holy Spirit? We see Peter instruct his audience, his listeners. Uh, he, we read in verse 38, turn with me again. Uh, he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is what you must do to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You must repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. Now, baptism doesn't automatically cause you to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There are people who are baptized with water, but don't have the Spirit with them. And there are those who are not baptized with water, but have been baptized with the Spirit. But for Peter's audience, those who are listening to Peter then, being baptized was an act of showing their public allegiance to Jesus. They were saying that, I trust Jesus, I will follow Jesus with their life. It was showing publicly, it, baptism is showing publicly that you trusted Jesus for salvation. Baptism is a public outward expression of that personal inner trust a person has in Jesus Christ. It's not a ritual that gives us spiritual life. It's an outward action that shows inner living faith in Christ. Therefore, Peter is in effect saying, repent and believe, every one of you. In Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, turn from your sins and turn to Christ with eager desire for forgiveness. Take note of the fact that those Peter was addressing were cut to the heart. They were convicted of their sins. The light came upon them, as Mark said. And they saw their sins and they were cut to their heart. They knew they needed a new heart. And they were asking, brothers, what should we do? They were asking with earnestness and almost desperation, what must I do to be saved? God often works in a person by having them hear the word of God, the law of God, and come under conviction of sin. And the spirit is involved in this. The light comes. Jesus is the light, but the spirit, uh, Jesus says of the spirit, when he comes, he will convict the world of guilt. The spirit works in a person to convict them of their sins and to detest their sins so that they're willing to turn away from it, to repent and hear the gospel and turn to Christ instead. The Spirit comes to dwell in us, and they live according to the Spirit, and not according to their sinful nature, which no longer reigns in them, though it might dwell as an unwelcome enemy. Now, this conviction of sin and turning from sin is another mark of genuine Christian. If you're a true Christian, You've turned from your sin and trusted in Christ. And you can only receive the gift of the Holy Spirit if you repent, if you turn, as Peter says here, from your sin of living for self rather than living for God who has made you. Turn from your sin of selfishness, of greed, of lust, anger, deceit, and slander, hatred, and so many other things that flow out from living for ourselves rather than for God who has made us to live in his image, to reflect his love and glory. You must let go of sin in your hand so that you may receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you hold on to sin, you can't receive. Uh, just as an illustration, imagine um, someone has come and said, I will give you an amazingly new stylish wardrobe. 
But imagine uh, you are holding on to your dirty clothes, your tatty, battered up clothes, filthy clothes. Uh, you wear these clothes with stains and holes, uh, and your wardrobe is full of them. And someone has said, I will give you a new wardrobe, a stylish one with all these designer brands and everything. It's brand spanking new. Imagine someone wants to give you these brand new stylish clothes. You need to get rid of your old clothes in order to receive these new clothes. If you hold on to these dirty clothes, there's no space for these new clothes. Likewise, you must let go of your sin and your love for it in order to receive the Holy Spirit. If you're holding on to sin, you can't receive. And when you receive the Holy Spirit, you receive the whole package. <laughs> you receive the forgiveness of sins. You receive God's breath of life. You receive God's presence. You receive God's revelation. There's a lot in that package, isn't there? You receive God's salvation and God himself. The gift of the Holy Spirit is the gift that contains all the gifts that we receive from God in Christ. It's the gift that keeps on giving, isn't it? So I conclude by asking you, have you received this gift of the Holy Spirit? If you haven't received this amazing gift yet, ask God with a sense of need, desperation even. Ask him, not half-heartedly, but with earnestness. And trust in the generous grace of God. He's the generous father in heaven who will, who will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Repent and trust in the forgiveness of your sins in Jesus alone. Don't hold on to your sins. Let go. Go with open hands to pray to God. Turn from your sins and your love of singing and trust in Jesus and give your allegiance to him. Trust him. And if you receive the gift, this gift of the Holy Spirit already, praise and thank God for such an amazing gift. And may we desire to be continually filled with the Spirit, that we may enjoy the fullness of life in God's life and light, his presence and power. So I want to convince you this morning. Let us not forget the Pentecost, but celebrate it and rejoice in the amazing gift of the Holy Spirit for undeserving sinners like us. Hallelujah. Let's close by singing together uh, the, hymn, the hymn, For Your Gift of God the Spirit. Uh, this hymn, I think, summarizes well many of the benefits that we receive in the gift of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the glorious Trinity. I will just read the first verse. Let's kind of meditate on it as we sing. For your gift of God the Spirit, power to make our lives 